You may be seated, and our children are going to head to their age-appropriate environments. And just a heads up today, we're beginning a, a sermon series that's a little more on the R-rated side of things, PG-13 at least. And so just let the parents in the room be aware. I want you to make that decision if your children should be in the room or not. We're going to be starting a new series on the book of Hosea in just a few moments. A couple of business items. First, I just want to say uh, thank you. There are a number of individuals who have moved to the nine o'clock service. I gave that challenge to the church a few months ago. We launched a new service. And the reason for that new service is to create more room in this hour, more room in our children's spaces, more room for parking. And a number of you have taken me up on that. You might be here at this later service just for today. But as the sun begins to come up earlier, just know that that 9 o'clock is an option. I may need to ask some, a few more of you to consider moving to 9 o'clock. Why? To make more room here at, at 1030. So uh, thank you for responding to that the last few months. Last weekend, church, we celebrated 13 baptisms. Woo! And yes, thank you. And if you give and serve here at Boulder Mountain, you're a part of that life change. So, so thank you. Uh, based on Isaac's question, what is the mission of the church? I already made a note, make mission more memorable, right? Uh, our, our mission here at, at Boulder is we make disciples as we help people find and follow Jesus. So last weekend... People identified their faith in Jesus as they went public with their faith through the work of baptism. If you're a guest with us, if you didn't get a chance to meet our guest services team out there, they would love to meet you after service just to gather some information, not so we can stalk you or show up at your front door unannounced, but to be able to answer any questions you might have about the church. Later in service today, we'll be honoring the Lord's Supper, remembering communion, so I want you to be prepared for that as well. As we dive into our text, begin a new series, would you join me in prayer? God, I ask that your Holy Spirit would move in this room, that you would convict, encourage, empower, illuminate, enlighten, challenge, support, whatever we need. God, that you would have the freedom to do that today. I pray that we would all hear from you, not from me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're beginning a new series on the book of Hosea. Hosea. I don't know. I already had a couple people after first service say I've never heard a message on Hosea. And so if you have a Bible, you can open that up. We have some Bibles in the back or you can pull it up on your device. Text will be on the screen. But I want you to get into God's word, not just on Sunday morning, but throughout the week. Explore, observe, ask questions about the text. Hosea, if you open up your Bible and it opens to Isaiah, you're going to turn right Go down a few blocks, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea is there nestled in. He's called a minor prophet, not because he was short or small or insignificant, but because his, the, the amount of information that he gave was less than the major prophets. In the Old Testament, you have 17 books of the Bible that are named after prophets, there are 17. Twelve of them are considered minor. Five of them are considered major. They all have really important things to say. They're not called major and minor based on the importance, but based on the amount of content that they had. So Hosea is one of those minor prophets. There's 133 prophets by name in the Bible. 16 of them are women. A prophet would take what God would tell them, and their job was to communicate that to the people. A lot of prophets, Elijah and Elisha, had actually school for prophets. You wanted to be a prophet, the nation of Israel, you could go to the school to be a prophet. Hosea, of the 12 minor prophets, they were, when you're studying the different literature of Scripture, and somebody says the 12, they're not talking about the 12 disciples. We're talking about the 12 minor prophets. And if I was given the assignment to be one of the 12, Hosea would be number 12 on my list. I do not want to be Hosea. You do not want to be Hosea. But he got the lucky straw. God asked him 
to do some things. What was the role of the prophet? The role of the prophet was primarily to proclaim truth. Large majority of what a prophet did was simply speak truth. Vast majority of the content of those 12 books and 17 books, speaking truth. This is what God says. Most people think when they hear prophet, they think, oh, they're, they're telling the future. They're predicting, predicting the future. That's something they did. It was a very small part of what they did. But they would reveal things about the future based on what God said to them. Those are the first two things, right? Proclaim, predict, and then every once in a while, God would ask the prophet, say, hey, that's not enough. I need you to, to go a step further. This is like bonus. I need you to demonstrate. I need you to do something, not just stand up and speak, not just proclaim, not just write a letter, but I need you actually to demonstrate with your life some things. And you think if you know some of the prophets, they were asked to do some, some crazy stuff. Hosea is one of those. We're going to look at that today. Prophets predicting, proclaiming, and then living their life out. And that is same as true for me, and I would believe that is true for you. If God has something for you to do, if God is using you to share with someone else, it first has to come into you. You have to wrestle with it. You have to kind of work through that text, let it kind of seep down into your soul before you can tell somebody else it. Think about the tr hard truths you've had to learn in your life. You had to live that before you could communicate it to someone else. And the same is true in the book of Hosea. Now, Hosea was a prophet to the nation of Israel. A little context about Israel as we, as we dive in. Israel at this point is in the middle of a civil war. There's a north and there's a south. We know something about that, right? There's a north and a south. The south is called Judah. The north is called Israel, Ephraim, throughout the book of Hosea. When you hear Ephraim, you're going to think Israel. Israel and, and Judah. Hosea was a prophet over many decades. Best way I can explain it to you would be like, Billy Graham was a spiritual advisor for many decades to six or seven different presidents. He sat in the Oval Office and counseled and gave truth to many different presidents, whether they listened to it or not. It's another story, but he was invited into that. Hosea was a prophet to many different kings many different times. Between 50 and 60 years, he was a prophet. In the Bible, there's two types of prophets that we're told about. I'll break it down for you very simply. One's a true prophet. A true prophet does not speak based on the situation, the circumstance. The true prophet, prophet speaks truth. God tells him, hey, say this. And I'm sure there were times where the prophet's like, really? If I tell him that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get killed. No, that's, you don't worry about that. Your job is to speak truth. True prophets, right? What does everyone want to say to the king? Long live the king. Kings love to hear that. Long live the king, right? False prophets, many false prophets. Ahab had 300 false prophets that were on the payroll. He hired them. Your job is to make the king happy. Tell the king what the king wants to hear. Long live the king. King, you're amazing. You're great. Your kingdom's going to reign forever and ever and ever, right? Who doesn't want to hear that? A true prophet comes in and says, hey, by the way, um, you're going to die tomorrow, right? Who, which, which king doesn't, wouldn't like that? And so true prophets, false prophets. Guess which one was more popular? False prophets. True prophets, there weren't very many of them. And they, they had to experience some things. And they had to count the cost. And so the enrollment at the school of prophets began to go down as they began to read letters like Hosea. Hosea got the assignment, an extremely difficult assignment. But when you follow Jesus, 
And when you raise your hand, say, hey, I want to be an agent of change in my community, in my nation, in my church, in my school, then it's going to require a sacrifice. Paul says in Philippians 3, verses 8 through 10, Paul says, what is more? I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Paul, modern day prophet, right, in the New Testament, Paul is writing saying, as I communicate and as I grow in my relationship with Jesus, I understand that I am to share in the sufferings of Jesus. Church, you and I, we're to share in the sufferings of Jesus. To follow him means... We're going to suffer. One of the first lessons Hosea is going to have to experience is the, the suffering. Now, God wants to communicate something extremely important to the nation of Israel. And sometimes a letter just won't cut it. And so he takes an individual, his name's Hosea. He says, Hosea, I want you to not just write a letter, not just give a sermon. I want you to live this out in your life. In 1936, King Edward VIII was on the throne in England. He was only there for a year before he abdicated his throne. But for the, one of the first times in history, he was going to give a speech to the nation of England, and it was going to be broadcast on radio for the entire nation of England. A radio station in New York worked really hard to say, how can we broadcast that message that's going to be communicated in England here in the United States. They want to hear what the king had to say. So the radio station works really hard, and they do all the tech work, and five minutes before the king comes to the podium to, to speak, and that radio transmission is going to be broadcast, one of the assistant engineers in the room walks across the room and kicks the cable, and the cable comes unplugged. And they're scrambling in the room. How are we going to broadcast the message that the king has to say? And one of the engineers in the room grabs the transmission, the radio signal from England, and he grabs the cable that's now going to be broadcast to the rest of the United States, and he stands there and he holds the two of them together, and that message is broadcast throughout the United States through the person of that engineer. If you want to know what a prophet is, that is the best illustration I can give to you. The prophet takes the message from God. God has something to communicate. And he is now, that message is going literally through the body and the person of Hosea as Hosea communicates it to an entire nation. That's what Hosea is called to do. A little background on Hosea. The message today, we're going to kind of do a flyover. And then each week, we'll dive a little bit deeper into the story of Hosea. What question are we asking as we look at Hosea? Here's the question. How much does God love you? How much does God love you? You may have an intellectual understanding that God loves you. I pray, my prayer this week has been that we would all come to grasp how much God loves us. And not just how much he loves us, what he's willing to do to show his love for you and for me. I pray that this changes your entire perspective. If you're a guest here with us, I want you to know how much God loves you. I want you to know that his grace and unconditional love is given to you, not more than anyone else, not less than anyone else. It's an offer for you today. Hosea chapter 1, if you found it, let me read just the first few verses today. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Beri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. These are all the kings of the southern kingdom, kings of Judah. And in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. Now what's happening, again, further context Kings mentioned here in the northern kingdom, evil. I'll save you a lot of homework and study in your commentaries. Jeroboam, servants of Solomon. Solomon recognized 
ultimately places him on the throne, Jeroboam, evil kings. What's happening to the nation of Israel? Economic prosperity. They are now in the land flowing with milk and honey. Things are good. There's been peace. People are making money. There's wealth. Caution. When blessings go up in your life, guard your heart. Your dependency upon an almighty God who created you will decrease. Has that been true in your life? As, as you recognize God's provision and faithfulness and things are really good in your life, be careful that you do not for, forget the God who brought you to where you are, the God who has blessed you, that has come from the hand of God. What is happening in the nation of Israel, as they prosper, they begin to turn their back on God and they chase false idols. Idols. Hosea writes this message and just a few years later, the Assyrians come in and take them captive. And so this message, Hosea, it's a last, it's a last call, letting them know how much God loves you. But listen, there are consequences to sin. Hosea series that we're on, the word underneath it is return. Another word for return in scripture is repent. It's not a popular subject. Most people don't like to talk about repentance, but it's a core theme of not just all of scripture, of Hosea. Repent. Return. Return to your first love. Is an area of your life that Jesus is not Lord over. The message for all of us today is return. And Jesus says to all of us, I don't want to just be the top of your list. I want to be your list. I just don't want to be number one in your life. I want to be number one in every category of your life. Is there an area of your life that you've been chasing an idol? God says today to return and repent. Verse 2. We're not going to go very far today. but We are going to look at verse 2 and 3. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, first words, he just finished, he graduated from the school of prophets. He's got his degree. He's ready to go. God, what's my first sermon going to be? It says the first. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go, go. He doesn't say, hey, I have an idea. What do you think about this? Hey, can we have a conversation? I want your input into some things. When, when God's about to do something in our lives, it's often, it's a command. It's not up for debate. And it's up to us to think, do I trust God? Do I trust that what he has for me is good? And the best that I could ever experience in this life is from him. And so God says, go. Don't write a letter. I don't have a message for you. I want you to go, and this is going to be your first assignment. You're going to demonstrate. You're going to demonstrate how much I love the nation of Israel. So Hosea is like, all right, I got it. He's maybe taking notes. What's my assignment? Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go. Take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom. For the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. And Hosea is like, hey, I, sorry, I misinterpreted. I thought you said whoredom. I thought you said a prostitute. I thought you said whore. I, I, miss, I, I, miss, I didn't hear that clearly. Can you tell me again? Some different translations here, we're using English Standard Version. There's, a, there's harlot in some translations, prostitute, whore, adulteress. You can't get away from it. This is the Bible. God's saying, I want to demonstrate how much I love the nation of Israel. Hosea, your first assignment is to go marry a prostitute. He's like, why did I go to prophet school? I should have followed in my father's footsteps as a masonry or carpenter. Now, there's different thoughts on what God's asking him to do here. And I just want to share with you two 
two very popular commentary opinions and, and let you kind of wrestle through that. The first says that he literally went and found a prostitute and married her. Now, maybe Hosea had dreams of marrying one day a beautiful woman, a godly woman, a, a good Jew, right, who lined up with his faith and maybe, you know, and he's setting up his profile online. He knew what he was looking for. And this was not it. This was not it. And so Hosea had to count the cost, say, okay, I guess the dreams for my life are out the window as a prophet. But God, whatever you say. So the first thought is, did he actually go and marry a woman who was already an adulteress, already a prostitute? So there's, there's some commentary and thoughts on that. The other thought is that God is saying, marry a woman who is adulterous in nature. You're going, the woman you're going to marry is going to have affairs. She's going to play the harlot. Hosea, you're going to marry a woman who's going to break your heart time and time and time again. She's going to betray you. How many of us would choose that? Now, some of us, that's been part of our story in this room. Some of our marriages, we've experienced adultery or we've experienced we were the victim or that's something we've done. And God chooses to use this to demonstrate and to show how much he loves the nation of Israel. Now, it's important to note, this is not a book on marriage. It's a book that talks about marriage. But this is not a book where we get all our cues on how to be a husband, how to be a wife by looking at this book. What God is speaking here is to demonstrate how much he loves the nation of Israel. Okay, I just want to make sure that's clear. When we experience adultery, there's a process we got to work through, and, and we got, there's a lot God has to say about that in other texts. This text is about God telling the people a message of unconditional love. And he tells Hosea, go marry a woman who's going to be unfaithful, who's going to break your heart. Why? Hosea, you, Hosea, you're, I'm inviting you to be in a pageant, and you're going to play the role of God in this pageant. Because what the nation of Israel is doing to me is what your wife is going to do to you. Your wife is going to play the harlot. And she's going to chase and look for love in all these other places. And Hosea, I want you to demonstrate that because that's what the nation of Israel is doing with me. They're my people. I love them. I provided for them. And they're playing the harlot as a nation by chasing after all these other idols, expecting these idols to fulfill them and to give them purpose and to give them meaning. Now, friends, this is really important. We often talk about God as our Father. And for some of you, that's been hard to understand and grasp because you're like, yeah, I had a Father and He wasn't good, and so how can God be like my earthly Father? And reality and truth is God is nothing like your earthly Father. God God is perfect. So we've had to wrestle through that. Some of us, we have God is our king, and we, we understand that. God's my king. God's my Lord. God's my savior. God's my shepherd, Jesus says. I am your shepherd. Throughout the next few weeks, we're going to come to understand Jesus and God as our husband. It's very different. It's a very different understanding. Now, Hosea, when he's writing, he's prophesying. It's, it's similar to when I was on vacation as a kid and we loaded up the station wagon, seven of us in the station wagon, and we leave Iowa and we head west to head to Colorado. And there were seven kids. I didn't get a seat because we were out of seats, so I laid on the wheel well. And the game was, as we're heading west, who can be the first person to see the Rocky Mountains? Ever played that game? When can you see the mountain? You drive across flat western Kansas and you get into eastern Colorado, and the, now the game's really on. When are you going to, it depends if it's a cloudy day or not. When can you see those mountains? And then you begin to see all these peaks start taking shape. And as you get closer, you realize there is distance between those peaks, right? There's miles. Sometimes you can drive an hour from one peak to one peak. But as, as you're looking at it, you don't know. Listen, a prophet who's predicting the future, that was the same way. They would write about the future not knowing that there were these big gaps of hundreds of years or thousands of years. or They're just seeing the future. 
Hosea did not know that Jesus was going to come and Jesus was going to identify himself as the bridegroom. Hosea did not know that the church is the bride of Christ and Jesus is the, the bridegroom. Jesus is the groom. Listen, church, Jesus is our husband. And some of us, again, we have to wrestle through that because your experience with a husband has not been good. And we have to understand a perfect husband, a perfect Jesus, is faithful, will never abandon you. There's nothing you can do where he's going to walk away. There's nothing you can do where he says, I, I choose to divorce you. Jesus will not do that. Jesus is the perfect husband. And I want to talk to you about marriage. It's not a marriage study, but for us to understand that God is our husband and God is faithful to the nation of Israel, even when they're not faithful, this is really important. There's three things I want to share with you when it comes to talking about marriage. Number one, if you've been married, if you are married, maybe you haven't been married, but you would understand this, your marriage relationship is your number one priority in, in this, on this planet. It's your number one relationship. If your marriage is strong, and everything else in your life has fallen apart, you wake up in the morning, you walk out of that house, and you walk from a, a place of strength because there's security and there's confidence in knowing that the person who knows me the most loves me the most. And everything else, it's not that it doesn't matter, but it's almost irrelevant because you can come home, and it's good. When your marriage is good, it gives you strength. There's a priority when your marriage is bad and everything else in your life is really good, have you been there? I've been there early in our marriage. Everything else could be going really well, but our marriage isn't good. And I leave the home from a place of weakness, and it bothers me all day long, and it, it nags at me and tugs at me all day long, right? Because there's a priority in marriage that's greater than any other relationship on planet Earth priority. What's God saying? You are my greatest priority. There is nothing greater. You are my number one priority. Now, I think Hosea had heard this message, and he had to work through this every day. It was a hard task. He had to be like, oh, really? Okay. I mean, I think it was really hard for him. He was probably had to have 12 support groups, right? He had to work through and say, well, let me tell you about my wife, right? He had to work through all that. It is not hard for God to love you. It is his priority. It is not hard for God to say, I choose to love you. He doesn't wake up in the morning and say, oh, I have to love Kyle today. It is part of his nature. That is who he is. He loves, and he loves you. Number one priority. Number two is intimacy. There's a relationship of knowledge when it comes to a marriage relationship. Listen, there's been times I can fake my parents when I was a kid. I think I pulled some things over on their head they never know, knew about. They still, I don't think, know about. Hopefully, they're not watching right now. There's some things, right? You, you tricked your parents. You can get away with some stuff. You can trick your kids into thinking that you're somebody that you're not. You can, you can play that game. You can trick your coworkers. You can trick your neighbors. You can't trick your spouse. That will get you. You can play that game for a little bit. Why? Because they know every detail about you. There is no more intimate relationship than a husband and a wife. Why does God say, I want to be your husband? There's an intimacy there. And then finally, there's life change. Your spouse has massive power. Now, don't, don't elbow the person next to you, who you're married to. <laughs> but I think you're going to get what I'm about to say. When somebody, somebody compliments me, Let's say that happened. Somebody said something to me. Oh, thanks. That's nice. Wow, great. Right? I can take it, but they don't really know me. I can fake it for a few minutes on a Sunday. What if my wife gave me that compliment? That's powerful. Why is that powerful? And she does compliment me. I'm so grateful for my wife. She's amazing. Because she knows every detail about me. When that compliment comes, it gives me security, it gives me confidence. Wow, you know everything about me and you choose to love me. Now, why is this so important that we talk about priority, intimacy, and life change? Because God is saying to the nation of Israel through this book, 
I am your husband. And Hosea, you're going to chase after your wife, whose name is Gomer. Don't laugh. Her name was Gomer. And God's going to do a work in Hosea's life. He's going to come to an understanding of how much God loves. God's going to do a work in Gomer's life. Long before she repents, and this is what blew my mind this week as I was studying this text. Because the gospel is you repent, Jesus will save you. Long before she repents, God pursues her. Long before the nation of Israel repents, God shows up and says, Noah, even, even though you're doing all of these things, even though you're playing the harlot, even though you're worshiping other idols, these idols did not create you. These idols will not save you. And you're chasing after them. God was demonstrating his love under the worst possible circumstances. In this pageant, Hosea plays God. Israel plays the harlot. It's important to understand this as we go forward in the next few weeks. Hosea, you're going to suffer as I suffer. God says to Hosea, you're going to experience the heart, your heart's going to be, your heart's going to be broken. In the book of Hosea, it's a heartfelt message communicated by a heart sick prophet about a heartbroken, a heartbroken God. This is how much God loves you. Hosea began his ministry at a time when things were so politically successful, economically prosperous, that people just didn't look to the Lord that they, that they should have. The seeds of idolatry, spiritual failure, moral corruption sown under Jeroboam's reign produced a tragic harvest in the following years. Hosea, she will be an adulterous wife. She will break your heart. She will trample on you. She will betray you. She will be unfaithful to you. But do not divorce her because I will never divorce my people. Yet I will show love. Yet I will show love. For us here today, for us here today, the question is, what have you replaced God for in your life? What area of your life is an idol that you have chased after, that you are playing the harlot? I will explain this in the next few weeks, the character of Gomer, what she does, and then Hosea's response. Some of us have been playing the harlot. There are things in our life what we would call as, as idols, what God would call as idols. You see, Gomer becomes a sex addict. She is completely out of control. She throws herself into the community and the world looking for her purpose from other men, looking for her value and worth, and some of us have done the very same thing in a lot of different areas. Our idol might be to make money, might be to have children, it might be to be married, it might be a political cause. Whatever that is, that is your real God. Small g, you and I are doing the same thing as giving our body to someone else. We're giving ourselves away by chasing idols that will never complete you. And know what God says? God says, your lover ultimately will kill you. What you think will give you fulfillment and purpose in your life, God knows. And he says, don't turn away, run away, return to me, because those things will kill you. Your addiction ultimately will take your life. Idols can't save you. They did not create you. God says, I did, and only I can save you. For all of us who find ourselves chasing after idols today, God says, you're a slave to that. And God desires and longs to break those chains. We sang about it this morning. All my hope is not in this world it's not in culture, it's not in my career, it's not in money, it's not in my family. It's in him, him alone. What did Hosea do? He did what God asked him. 
someday we're going to get to heaven and we'll have a chance to interact with some of the authors of Scripture. And so let me just, this is a little side comment. If you don't know your Bible, I encourage you to read your Bible. If you know Jesus, one day you're going to be in heaven with them and they're going to come up to you and be like, hey, did you read my book? You're like, who are you? <laughs> Hosea. My name's Hosea. Did, did you like my book? As you read the book, you'll be able to interact with Hosea and you can ask him, hey, tell me about that. You had to have struggled through that, right? And I'm sure he did. But he went and he did what God asked. And the first few chapters of the book of Hosea are going to talk about his personal life. Verse chapters 1 and 2 is about a faithful, faithless wife. Chapter 3 is about future restoration. Chapter 4 is about a fickle nation. Chapters 11, 12, and 13 is all about a faithful God. How much does God love you? So much so that he will never leave you. He will never divorce you. He will never forsake you. Despite all that we do, he remains faithful. Church, I want you to begin to understand and grasp that God is your husband. He loves you. This month, our culture will celebrate artificial love, passions and obsessions and infatuations. Don't buy the lie. Don't buy the lie. God's unconditional love is best for you and for me. If there's an idol in your life that the Holy Spirit's revealing to you, deep, dark, down in the nook and crannies where God says, I want to be, God says, I want to know every nook and cranny. I do know every nook and cranny, but I want you to know that I know, and I want you to confess to me, return to me, admit that. That happens through a couple of different ways. It happens by sharing that with a close friend, another trusted follower of Jesus. So you can sit down, you can be honest with, say, hey, this is what I'm struggling with. Some research says 70% of men struggle with sexual addiction. I've heard it said much higher than that, 70% of men. If that's you, that's an idol. You're chasing after something you know will never fulfill you, never complete you. You know that. And God says, return to me. It's going to be hard. It's going to take work. So confess it to another person. Every Friday night here in this room, we have something called Life's Healing Choices. We're in the middle of it. You can come. You can show up. It's a safe place to wrestle with some things, talk some things out that you might be struggling with. We all have stuff. Every one of us in this room, there's something that we struggle with. If not, you're one of the three or four people on this planet who's perfect. <laughs> God's desire through the book of Hosea is to show the world how much he loves us. How much he loves us. How much he loves you. Would you pray with me? And so God, as we prepare our hearts for communion this morning, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would, number one, remind us how much you love us. Remind us of our position in you that there's nothing we can do to fall out of your favor through the person of Jesus. We're not that powerful. Thank you for the redemption that bought us back, that removed those chains from us. And God, for anyone in the room who's, who's recognized that there is an idol, that they would have the wisdom to know what to do and the courage to do it, that they would take that step. God, thank you for your unconditional faithful love, even when we are faithless. We love you. We pray you would continue to teach us as we walk through this special book. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email, or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, 
uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.